Wednesday. Eight. This is the uh, of twenty twenty four. This is the endo meeting. Let's start with. Let's start with roll up. So it used to be that CES, okay, so CES is written as a collection of ECMAScript modules, and it has been since before ECMAScript modules were really viable in Node or browsers. Um, and, in its in, and in the early incarnations, we relied upon Rollup to be our ESM implementation that generated artifacts that could be um, embedded on the web as a script tag or um, imported as if they were common JS and node prior to version 12. Um, or you, know, we did for a while use node r ESM, the standard things as a uh, emulation, which was a Babel down compile from ESM to common JS. Um, but yeah, the distribution files were generated with rollup. This was dissatisfying to us because rollup does a few things that um, are are fan, are so for one rollup has a lot of my respect for being one of the first ESM implementations that actually took advantage of the design of ESM in order to um, in order to create interlinkage between modules and a um, lexical interlinkage that that was obvious obviously the implication was that the semantics would resemble what you would produce with rollup at uh, like lexical variables that are sh simply shared between module namespaces that are managed by the import and export expressions that's what rollup does it also as a consequence as mark is off uh, pointed out erases the boundaries between modules which makes it difficult to see the lexical the lexical boundaries between individual modules in a rollup um, and also makes rollup participate in the supply chain for the trusted compute base of CES. So what's that mean? We want to minimize the amount of surface area that an attacker could mount on the supply chain Wait. of CES. Let, let me, let, uh, especially since we're recording, I want to expand on that point because it's, it's a lot worse than what you stated. Um, the semantics that Rollup is um, trying to preserve, you know, what it is that the that is considered to be a semantics preserving transformation by the the designers of Rollup uh, is not aligned with, uh, for you know, quite understandable reasons, not aligned with the defensive semantics that has to be preserved for CES. Uh, and the, so it's, it's not like the supply chain problem here is that somebody might introduce a malicious problem. It's that roll-up might be inadvertently from our perspective, introducing a failure to be defensive that otherwise preserves all semantics. Uh, and it would be perfectly correct for the roll-up goals to do that, and it would make it unusable for us. So, uh, in order to preserve the trusted compute base of CES uh, in the face of uncoordinated maintenance to roll-up, um, we... Uh, we found an opportunity to obviate rollup in our tool chain by using, by reusing the mechanisms that we had already in place for uh, converting ESM modules into uh, into a, in, into functors that would be wired up with uh, that, that were designed that were intended to be executed underneath CES eval or, or under the evaluate function in a compartment. Um, but because we're building, we're using this to bootstrap CES, we don't have compartment available to us at the baseline. So we can't use compartment evaluate to evaluate these functors. We have to manually um, reconstruct the calling convention for, for linking these functors to each other. For the most part, this works. And the reason that this works is that CES 
exists within this very narrow subset of ESM, not very narrow, a, a, a let's just call it narrow, um, where we don't acknowledge the existence of live bindings. We have no need for them. We don't use them. Um, and because we have no need or use of them, the subset that it, we exercise in CES happens to be a subset that one can trivially link with the uh, and we, by concatenating the module functors into an array and then calling that on a linker um, that that is aware of the that is aware of the namespaces of the imports and exports of all of the of all of the modules and so we basically construct a cell object for every property and then the cells are able to observe mutation uh, access the current value and um, emit notifications to other modules in the in the event that they are assigned to in the event that you have a mutable export however live bindings in cess rely upon a uh, having a module lexicals object in the scope chain that is introduced via the however many, many line, magical lines of eval code the now quadruple backflip if you will that in, yeah introduces a module lexicals object and the module lexicals object exists to capture assignment to free variables with the name uh, with the lexical name of an exported live binding which we found no other way to emulate without compromising our other main objective, which was minimal, um, minimal, minimal interference with lines of code on which import and export statements do not exist, right? So if we changed, so, so there is a possibility that we could have implemented um, a module functor for CES that did not rel rely upon the module lexicals, but it would require us to change lines of code that utter um, uh, assignment to live bound exports to change those into um, assignment with an uh, with notification emission to the to the cell the, to the corresponding cell that's linked in other modules. This is a kludge, of course. Rollup does the more the more ESME thing, and that is, eh, it's just that your live bindings are simply variables that are shared lexically by all of your modules and are otherwise unutterable. Um, which, by which, by the way, I mean the that that itself uh, causes a safety violation. That um, uh, which is that in the language as as specified. Uh, a module that imports a live binding should not be able to mutate it. Right, right, and that's not protected. Um, in any case, yeah. So that's that's one semantic relaxation of rollup. Thank you, Mark. That's very specific. Um, the, uh, yeah. So within, so basically, we're, I uh, at, at this juncture, the use cases for this bootstrapping bundle generator are expanding um and the question is are they expanding to cover any use cases in which live bindings are used and if so should we put some guardrails some documentation or a variation and behavior for the specific use case so that live bindings are better supported so what is the use case i mean i'm just very surprised that this ever came up practically at all yeah. Uh, what, so, what what yeah. what uh, what was the, the use case? The use case was very simple. Uh, we had a uh, we had a export const that was later replaced with uh, a mutable variable uh, that was being assigned in a try catch in case a capability is not present uh, in the host. And only after that try catch, it was being exported. So okay. was it, was this we code exported a let variable. Is this the code real... that you're responsible for or code that from a third party that you have to make sure works? 
uh, this is our code and we can reassign the variable to a const and this is what we're, we did okay. in the pull request. Uh, so this is definitely not a necessary use case. And oh, upon discovering uh, why uh, it uh, failed, discovered. I was more concerned about the, the transform uh, doing live bindings being incomplete. But if that's intentional, then I don't have any further concerns, I guess. I think okay. that we should at least document the limitation um and 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 document like document the narrow prescription for when it's appropriate use, appropriate to use bundle.js in the compartment mapper because it is it is a limited subset it's it's a subset where like you really wouldn't use this for code that you do not control you wouldn't bring in like you wouldn't use this it isn't a secure mode we could create a secure bundle.js that relied upon compartment. Um, and that would be able to support um, live bindings and also is attractive because we would be able to use it for bootstrapping um, excess, excess workers on our chain um, and, and thereby get a better debugging experience for the lowest almost the lowest layer of our bootstrapping process <laughs> is like we start with no esm we create the ses bundle and that gives us a compartment once you have a compartment either native or ses or the adapter then you can write a bundle that is uses eval and then uses compartment to the do the interlinkage between those funk doors um, which is spiritually similar to the nested evaluate format that we have used for the kernel to date. We haven't replaced it yet. Um, what's moving in this is that uh, in order to embrace native compartments on chain for Agoric, um, we need to have uh, an excess mode for the ses shim in the same way that uh that leo and and you are implementing uh um a hermes mode for the ses shim right um and our, our intention is to use conditional exports from package conditional exports and that allows us to do things at various state at, at various layers right on excess we not only need to have different behaviors for ses we need to have different behavior for the module source constructor and different behavior for the import bundle um, package as well. So it's like a tidy little, tidy little problem that is easily solved by, oh, look, we already implemented um, conditional exports with the compartment mapper. Um, we just need to use that instead of rollup for more cases at Agoric um, and, and then thereby get more leverage out of bundle.js in the compartment mapper. But it's still like, we would only use this for the lowest level layers of our architecture to bundle up CES with the rest of live slots and um, uh, and and like just the bootstrapping for XS. Okay, I like this plan. Yeah. Um, if someone does inadvertently use a live binding where it's not supported, um, uh, so ZB, when you did this. What did you get a diagnostic or did you just get a failure to propagate the changed value? Um, I'm going to share the screen to make it easier to explain. Yeah, it could. I'm guessing it manifested either as a reference error. It or... manifests. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, the transformed bit where we have a let variable that gets transformed uh, with, by adding a prefix and it gets passed to a live binding. And then the original name of the variable is used for later assignment. Uh, and that means with ah. module lexicals, this is going to work and the hello world value goes where it belongs. Uh, but if module lexicals are not implemented, hence uh, in the bundle JS case, uh, we get an error that says uh, books is not defined. 
Excellent. Excellent. Our name Thank was slightly different, but yes, this was an error that results from assigning to a, a undeclared variable under strict mode. Okay. So yeah, so I was very I would have been very concerned if it was just a silent failure to propagate, but with it being an error, even if the error itself is is a bit mysterious, mm -hmm. a error that prevents um progress combined with documentation seems like a, a, a good plan. Yeah, All right. it's good enough yeah. for bundle JS. Since we've and come to this happy conclusion. It made me understand what module lexicals are doing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, since we've reached this happy conclusion, I would like to divert to a minor tangent. If I recall, I I actually have a, a question. Substantial and, question. Go ahead. Well, yes, this 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 relates to my own relative ignorance, and uh, um, you know, maybe I don't need to take everybody else's time for this. So, if this is just better handled as an offline conversation, that's fine. Also, um, which is uh, we're talking about. Well, there's there's sort of two different contexts of bundling that are interest here. One is the things that are used to construct sort of the infrastructure of our respective worlds. Um, um, and then the other is the thing that's used to bundle up arbitrary third-party user code of unknown provenance. And um, the, the general practice of, well, let's deprecate roll up wherever we can. Um, is hard to hard to enforce on the rest of the world. Um, the question is is uh, merely by dint of uh, loading unknown uh, external bundles into compartments sufficient for us to just not care what kind of bundler they're using. It seems like in order to be able to execute the loading in the first place, you have to have some common basis of understanding what, what actually is the format, the structure of a bundle in order to be able to unbundle it, to use so, it. So for questions like this, we always need to start with the distinction between def the defensive code problem and the offensive code problem. Okay. The offensive code problem is can I be sure that your code can't do any damage beyond the limits I thought I set on your code? Right. And loading a arbitrarily mangled bundle into a compartment solves the offensive code problem because the bundle, the output of the bundler is just JavaScript code. And therefore a bad bundler can't do anything that bad JavaScript code can't do. Right. The defensive code problem is, does my code mean what I think it means, including does my code defend itself as it's supposed to when in contact with objects I don't trust? And a, the, the, a bundler that uh, destroys language invariants that we're counting on for defensiveness, but prever preserves the functionality that meets their correctness criteria uh, uh, fails to solve the defensive code problem. Okay, that makes sense to me. The, the, the reason I ask is because we're in the midst of sort of early stages of exploration on the uh, MetaMask OCAP kernel. And uh, it's gonna resemble swing set in a lot of ways and um, the sort of next step of exploration is, well, I want to have a bunch of different bats that are running random things from wherever um, and getting tangled up in, uh, why, why do we have roll up in our code base? Um, and this sounds like um, for, for, for internal build purposes, the I was just I had been just thinking well we'll just use the the endo uh, bundler and it sounds like in fact exactly the right answer am I right good yeah okay. I think so okay excellent okay 
carry on. Which, is, which for the record, has become re easier in the most recent release. We released yesterday, so I'm sure that this is out. I think it's been out for a month. Um, you can now do bundle dash source with dash F to choose a format for your bundle. And endo script is the format that will give you bundles generated with make bundle in the compartment mapper, the, the kind that CES is. Um, it gives you the JSON envelope, which you should remove. <laughs> um, but otherwise, it's pretty straightforward to use. Okay. Um, ZB, you used a metasyntactic variable of the the Kooks, Kooks, Kuaooks family. And I have no idea how we've decided, whether and how we've decided to pronounce these, but I propose that it should be Kooks, Kuaooks, Kuaooks. Any objections? <laughs> Always heard it pronounced in variations of quacks. Quacks. The Q U is a is a Q rather than a K. Mm -hmm. Because what about the other U's? <laughs> well, let's just make it even more so. So is anyone else here an old enough Lisp programmer that you remember having the to parse old. audio like Kadatter? <laughs> oh yeah. I know about that's, it. I think that's, that's why that's, Kadatter that's and Twitter are better than head and tail. Yep. Now, yeah. um, this is untrue, provably, but <laughs> <laughs> provably. <laughs> uh, the the a question that uh, another question is the origin of Kooks, Quacks, the that whole family. I think that that was Oliver Steele, um, but I'm not sure. Especially now that Oliver Steele is a character on American Idol and not a computer programmer. <laughs> as a main character for his Google search. Um, but yeah, I, I found him. Um, but I, Wikipedia had no, the jargon file does not provide any special insight into the origin. Um, I'm pretty sure it was Oliver Steele, though. He was, he was doing lispy things. Anyone know? No. Just from the jargon file. Yeah, yeah, I just think, oh, those MIT guys, and that's about as deep as I get. Hmm. That might just be it. That might be the end of the trail. But I, the, it doesn't explain how well. But my understanding was that there were some variety of autodidacts arrived at metasyntactic variables, starting with the military slang and then the, um, and some other folks started with words they made up on the spot without much care. And <laughs> yeah. How did F F U become F O O? Uh, whimsy. As far as I know, I don't, it's not actually certain that it did. Um, it's just the the etymological trail suggests that one was inspired by the other. There's no um, first-hand account. All right, we're at halftime. Do we have other topics for today? I know that uh, Chris and ZB are we're whittling away at the trampoline problem for the compartment mapper. Uh, I can offer a bit of an update of what I'm up to, which does overlap with that and will likely cause strife. This uh, is the, the trampoline problem is emulating an async function using a generator and a driver. Yeah. Or okay. specifically allowing an implementation to be shared by um, a synchronous a synchronous <laughs> application and yeah. an asynchronous application. Okay. <laughs> Just skip the A before synchronous. <laughs> um, Fun yeah. fact, uh, native English speakers, nine out of 10 native English speakers do not know that in parallel to A and and there is also um, 
the and the that are distinguished in usage by are supposed to be distinguished in usage by the same rule. The is supposed to pronounce be pronounced the, but only in front of words that begin with a vowel sound. I did not know this. Yeah. Added to memory banks. <laughs> it, yeah. it is the the only only humans alive today who know this are singers. So uh, I have to agree. Sorry, um, Chris. From the from what went by in chat, did you perhaps mean Guy Steel when you said Oliver Steel? No. No. Okay. Yeah, I I am aware of the distinction. Yeah, Oliver Steel is much harder to find. It might have been Guy Steel, but I've don't think so. Oh, right. Um, the thing that I'm puttering around with was uh, the there are three lanes of work that we are delving into to make it possible to reduce bundle sizes. Um, the chain has a bun has a, a size limit for contracts when they're submitted to it, which is creating a, a very strong motivator to make our bundle smart smaller. One of those things is that I've added a mode that was released yesterday to the bundler that allows you to erase the interior, replace the interior, blank out the interior of comments. Um, so you can, you have a line, a line number preserving option to erase about half of endo when it's imported into a bundle because we, we wrote copious comments. Um, the, uh, but yeah, uh, blanking it out allows those comments to continue to participate in the automatic semicolon, in, semicolon insertion algorithm as equivalent to what was there before. So, and also not displace line numbers. So the, that's the way we, reason we went with that, um, as opposed to simply erasing all comments, which does, which would be, yeah, invasive in other ways. Um, the, um, the other the other direction that we are pursuing is making it possible to exit to host modules. So there's a new feature where if a module specifier starts with something that looks like a URL scheme, like node colon FS, the bundler will the bundler for the archive format, and this is relevant to the pet daemon as well, um, will omit that module from the bundle. So node FS, for example, is implicitly omitted from bundles, uh, which means that the you have to provide an import hook. Um, the to, it, when you use import bundle, you have to provide an import hook that fills in that hole. Um, that's apropos of the the change that I uh, sent to ZB to review yesterday. Um, that uh, that makes that that required a refactor in the policy enforcement system. The policy enforcement system currently assumes that all for an attenuated exit module, the the module descriptor is is expected to be a virtual module source, um, previously called a third party static module record, um, mm -hmm. and the full range of possible uh, full possible import hooks is the entire module descriptor domain. Um, so I have a proposed change that it, that removes the bottleneck, but only if you are not applying a policy. If it's a, if you are applying a, an attenuator, it, it still must be a virtual module source. Uh, it would be legitimate to make sure that it also, accepts a module descriptor that contains a source property for a virtual module source, since that is the form that we'll be encouraging going forward, because that is the form that has parity with XS. Um, but yeah, uh, for, for I'm now. I'm not sure if I follow everything because I didn't prepare by reading the whole thing yet, uh, but uh, is that 
uh, is that visible to the end user? Uh, I It think does. it's only it's only inside of the implementation. Um, it the bottleneck was observable that for the case where you're not using a policy, there were certain module descriptor shapes that needed to pass through the attenuator unchanged that were not accepted by the attenuator if a policy was enforced. The 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 only Uh, without the policy, what's an attenuator? It, 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 the attenuator function is the function that takes a module descriptor and returns a module descriptor, the adapter mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. an exit module takes a module descriptor and returns a module descriptor and decides whether to attenuate it based off of web off of the policy. Yeah. That function needed to pass a broader range of module descriptors through in order for exits to work. Okay, got it. Now, um, and while I was there, I did a little bit of refactoring, which should make it possible to use virtual module source module descriptors in the excess form as well, even if you're attenuating them. Um, Mm but -hmm. that, that's, that's what to look, that's what uh, is needed to look for there. It's also a really good question whether it has, whether the, you have, whether your attenuators need to exit to a virtual module source or whether that could be expanded to some other forms. I don't know. Um, the virtue of a virtual module source is that it has explicit, an explicit list of exports. Um, whereas we now accept namespace descriptors where you can infer by looking at the uh, get own property names to figure out what the exports are. Um, now, I don't know. While I was digging in there, I also noticed a discrepancy between how XS does lifting of module namespace objects into module um, into module records internal to CES and what we do in the compartment mapper for the same effect. And the only real difference there was um, for one, the compartment mapper uses object assign to copy properties from uh, from the namespace into the environment record and also assigns the namespace to the default property. Um, whereas XS doesn't do the default property and uses own property descriptors or get own property names to find the exports. So that might. Uh, the default might have something to do with common JS support. Mm -hmm. Almost certainly. You said get own property name. That excludes symbols as well. I believe so. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Symbol exports. aren't really a thing. Exports. Got it. Okay, right, right, right. Exports. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't recall what else I intended to do within compartment mapper, but, um, That was the space that I'm wandering around in. Uh, Okay. I may, yeah, the, there there might be rebase conflicts because I added um, the URL detection. The, the, if you have a URL schema prefix on a module specifier, there's a special condition in either the module map hook or the import hook. I don't recall which. Okay, so that's going to mean some updates to uh to solve the conflicts in the pull request for uh dynamic imports uh, sorry dynamic require <laughs> Yeah. really dynamic import now That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And also while I was rummaging, rummaging around there, it occurred to me that the incess, the compartment prototype, it provides a load method. Everybody remembers the load method, I assume. The For those just tuning in, the load method on the compartment <laughs> on a compartment uh, induces the compartment to uh, use the, um, the the various hooks to pr 
to produce module records for every transitive dependency of a particular module specifier uh, without executing them. So it advances it advances them all into the load all of the transitive dependencies of that entry into the loaded state if they weren't already there. Um, the uh, this is spiritually very similar to imports dot source in module harmony. So there's a very strong possibility that that will motivate us, motivate us to rename load or create a sister method to load called import source for purposes of standardization um, that returns that returns a module source, a promise for a module source or a promise for a module instance. I'm not sure which. Uh, yeah, promise for a module source. There would be a, a separate method for returning the module instance, which would probably correspond to import.instance or import.module, depending on where Harmony goes. Anyhow, just a prediction. That's probably the direction that the spec is going to go. All right. Uh, I've run so, out of uh, is, is the consequence uh, of the new function going to be the same? Uh, the module uh, and all of its dependencies being uh, in a state where you can synchronously start running them? Yeah, I think that this co would correspond to an import now, import dot now becoming the dynamic import version of import now. Yeah. In which case the invariant would be that import awaiting import dot source and that followed by would, would mean that a success succeeding to await import dot source would put you in a position where subsequently imp calling import dot now would be guaranteed to run to completion. Well, rather not not to fail to load. Okay, so with that, so I like that. Uh, it does mean that um, uh, the result of that load is that it's memoed rather than cached, where the distinction is that a memo can't drop something and a cache is free to drop something. Yeah, this is definitely building the memo. Okay, good. Now, I, I don't think that any of the proposals are framed in terms of caching. Right. There's no, there is no eviction in the module loader. Or rather, there is no eviction in module harmony. However, you could have an import hook that falls through to a cache for fetch, for example, and the cache could be evicted. Oh, yeah. And that's that's harmless. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good to see you folks. Yeah. Um have I already mentioned that Nicolo has made progress on the um on the Babel generator transformation? Um, I'm expecting to get a pre-release tag from Babel anytime this week so that we can start integrating that. And I believe that overlaps with uh, other concerns about transforms. You mentioned yeah, he was going to. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be great. Do you think it's possible that we could actually have that all integrated by the next end of release? That... I would call unlikely. Okay. Not impossible. Yeah, it might be it might actually be responsible to wait for an official release. Um All right. <laughs>